First of all, um, let me welcome you and let me introduce myself. I know many of you, but there are some new faces. My name is Alison Johns and I'm your president of AUA. Um, I've been a member for 21 years, so if any of you are thinking of leaving, stick with it. It's a really good organisation. That's enough of a plug for now. My real purpose is to introduce our panel discussion session this afternoon. Last year it was a great success and so we thought we would bring together another distinguished panel for you this afternoon. I shan't introduce them because Will Spinks sat in the middle there, um, who is the Secretary and Chief Operating Officer here at Manchester, will undertake that a little later on. The question that we're asking them to consider and to discuss and reflect upon is universities belong to students. And I think this is a really interesting time. I work at Hefke, we have a new role as the student champion, and we're still really working through what does that mean for us. The white paper student at the heart of the system, I'm sure you're really working through what that means for you. So in current times, there's much really to discuss about who really owns the sector, who owns the university. Who has that preeminent claim to it? I mean, is it the students? Is it business? Is it society? Is it the state? I think there are multiple claims there, and uh, this is a useful time for us to debate who really is the owner. I think perhaps um, think about whether that long-held and proud tradition of intellectual challenge and you know, intellectual ownership of higher education, whether that's being threatened by market forces. And perhaps more importantly for us, if we're a little bit selfish this afternoon, to try and work through, well, what does that mean for us? As committed professionals who are committed to higher education, committed to supporting the academic enterprise, already committed to students and their learning. What does that mean for us? Well, as I said, we do have a very distinguished panel here to help us with this. They're going to share their expertise, they're going to share, they're going to discuss, they're going to inspire us, they're going to challenge our thinking. And so without further ado, I'd like to hand across to Will. Uh, in terms of what I'm going to do, I'm just going to introduce the panellists and then in a moment we'll ask uh, after that the panellists to come up and speak for five minutes uh, or so. And I'll say a little bit more uh, about that in a moment. But to my left is Pam Tatlow. She's been the chief executive of the university think tank Million Plus since 2007. There's a long description of her... Um, uh, achievements in the past contained in the programme in the documentation in front of me but Pam doesn't want me to go through all of those but she has been um, active in schools and colleges in the public sector generally school governor and also appointed as a lay judge to the employment appeal tribunal which I guess gives her lots of stories to dine out on at the end of, of the evening. To my right is Anthony McLaren, who took up the post of Chief Executive of QAA on the 1st of October 2009, having uh, previously been the Chief Executive of UCAS. Um, he studied at the University of Kent, has worked at Warwick, at Hull, and he's also been a council member and chair of council at the University of uh, Gloucestershire. So he's got a wide range of experience right across uh, the sector. I'm delighted Anthony's uh, with us today. On my far left, your far right, um, take it whichever way uh, you wish, uh, Heather Fry from Hefke is with us. She joined Hefke in 2008 as Head of Learning and Teaching and then subsequently became Director for Education and Participation in April 2010. Um, she's worked at Imperial College London in the past, in Queen Mary, and also at the Institute of Education. And in her Hefke role, she has particular responsibilities for learning and teaching and widening participation. Welcome, Heather. And on my far right, your far left, I don't know if you've been described as being on the far right uh, before, <laughs> Rachel. Uh, but the far left, as far as the audience is concerned, I have Rachel Wenstone, who's a National Executive Counselor uh, for NUS. Rachel was a sabbatical at Leeds uh, University, and with another hat on, I know that Leeds um, Student Union is one of the very few student unions in the country that received the gold accreditation from the Students' Union Evaluation Initiative, and that's a very rare achievement. Um, and to Rachel's credit, um, I know that after having got that accreditation, she was part of the executive team that subsequently put themselves forward for re-accreditation, recognising they got gold the first time, 
you can only go down from, from gold, but I'm delighted to say that um, uh, they achieved gold again, and that's a very significant achievement indeed, the only union in the country, I believe, that's been able to do that. Rachel's cur currently studying for an MSc at the LSE in Human uh, Rights. Well, thanks very much. Um, I thought that perhaps we should begin the session by saying universities belong to technicians, but let's move on. Um, <laughs> It's actually quite common to be invited to speak on platforms these days where the academics claim that universities belong to those administrators and managers. And of course, administrators will tell you that the academics behave as if universities belong to them. And, you know, universities are not always themselves consistent about whether you belong. I mean, I have a first degree from a university uh, which no longer wants to know me because the institution of which, uh, which I studied is now part of another institution. So remarkably, I get a replacement first degree certificate from one university, but actually it's another university that asks me for money. So <laughs> um, work that one out. Now, the Secretary of State for Education clearly believes today that A-levels belong to some academic staff. Uh, and in his usual non-biased, even balanced way, what he really means is some academic staff, some, some universities. Contrast that with biz ministers, who are much keener on students as consumers, customers, clients, um, and actually, you know, universities themselves buy in expensive client relation management systems, which you're all very good at operating. But, of course, universities themselves appear to have a need to belong to each other. And I think belonging to each other is different from the concept of affiliation. I mean, the Russell Group expands in a club that clearly they think is a good thing. Whether all members of the Russell Group now accept all members of the Russell Group is entirely another thing, and the jury's out. Watch for it in the Times higher. But let's also think about some of the other things that we're managing in which students are involved. Now, Anthony is going to talk, I'm sure, about the quality assurance process. And I've got to be slightly honest about this, which is I think some of the involvement of students in that risks, up, risks mixing up some ideas about student involvement and participation. And it goes back to some of the confusion and the debate that there was, for example, and you can tell what my background was uh, uh, years ago, which was about actually when um, belong means the ownership of property. And that could get us into the whole Marxist discussion about ownership and means of production and how that compares with a system in which we're expecting students to collaborate and at times compromise. So the concept that universities belong to students is, of course, less than a perfect concept. But I would much prefer that than actually the idea that um, business belongs to universities or universities belong to business. Because I actually think that that's a completely different prospect and one that lurks behind much of the coalition's thinking. And I think it's surprising that ministers see no difference between universities operating in the shareholder interest compared to a broader public interest. So I definitely want to oppose the idea that universities belong to business. Now, I will simply conclude by saying this. Now, however difficult students can sometimes be, and we know they change their minds, we, don't, we know they don't always finish their courses because of caring responsibilities, and that leads to a lot of counting and negotiations with organisations like Hefke. Parents are always come along with them, and they think they, they know more than you do. The SLC doesn't always pay them, and the coalition wants a market in their numbers. In spite of all of these trials and tribulations, um, I actually think we should support the idea that universities belong to students. I mean, as Thomas and Jefferson said, one of the U as early US presidents, the earth belongs to the living. So my vote is let's give it to students for their verb, dynamism, and innovation. Where on earth would we be without them?
Thank you, Pam. Um, given that it's a, um, not a very good idea for students to get involved in the QAA process, I thought I'd go to Anthony next as the Chief Executive of the QAA to give his five minutes. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, the proposition universities belong to students. At, I suppose one response might be at £9,000 a year, they ought to, uh, and certainly will before too long. It's a pretty heavy down payment. But actually, I don't believe that universities belong solely to students. I think, and you may accuse me of hopeless idealism, that they actually belong to all of us, even those of us who will never go to them. Uh, I do believe that they are... Uh, public goods and the organization that uh, I've been with since uh, 2009 as you heard from the introduction has at the heart of its mission the safeguarding of the public interest in the quality and standards of higher education I think that's why universities are or should be and we might get on to discussing perhaps why they're not as valued as that um, public ownership might suggest it's why they're such a hugely important asset it's why they are independent uh, in this country and why that's such an important quality and historically at least why they have tended to be charities and um, run on a not-for-profit basis. They're public assets uh, that have had a great deal of public investment. That does not mean to say that they are uh, unequivocally part of the public sector or that they aren't part, uh, heaven forfend, of government or anything to do with it independent bodies but very much fulfilling a public function and belonging to the whole society but of course the way in which that plays out will differ at different times and that's what we're here today to explore I do believe that students are critical stakeholders in our universities I think that our universities work at their best when students are very actively engaged in those universities and colleges of higher education and in the quality of the provision there and I have absolutely no doubt to give one example that the quality of uh, work at the University of Kent in the Department of English was immeasurably enriched by my brief but glorious period as a course representative for medieval studies during my time there as an undergraduate it matters that students are key stakeholders not only at the point and I think we're in danger of focusing exclusively on this not only at the point where they're making their decision about which institution to go to important though that decision is and I guess I would say that as a former chief executive of UCAS but also and absolutely critically throughout the time they spend at the institution in providing feedback evaluation uh, contributing through discussion participation um, co-producers is a term that's often used particularly by colleagues in NUS helping to produce the education which they are receiving students of course learn from each other not simply from the academic staff and they actively participate in teaching each other and contributing to the overall um, academic output of the institution for us in quality assurance and Pam has referred to the role that quality assurance might have at the increasing place that the student voice has within it um, I think we center our thinking at the moment on the engaged student the concept of the engaged student encouraging and supporting and this is the purpose of the work we're doing with NUS at the moment uh, more students to share genuine ownership uh, of the quality and standards of the institutions uh, where they're studying by becoming more engaged in those quality and standards, students can have a significant impact not only on the quality of the education that they receive during the time they're at the institution, but also on the quality of the education of those who come afterwards. And I think in thinking about student engagement with higher education, it's important that we don't only focus on those students who are choosing to go to a particular institution, or even those students who are at the institution at that time, but of course also as we frequently see when there are difficulties with institutions those students who have graduated from a particular institution have a great stake in the continuing reputation and value of the institution that they have uh, they hold a qualification from um, it is the case that there are limits to uh, the engagement and I think I would share uh, some of the points that Pam made in that regard um, Roger Brown with whom I shared a platform last week at a happy uh, breakfast seminar is fond of talking about higher education as a post experience good um, I don't think I would follow him in concluding that because it's that students really don't know what they want and can't know what they want when they go to university but it must be the case that 
Students can't know everything they want from an institution. Otherwise, we're denying the process of growth and development that takes place as part of um, higher education learning. In our review methods, we've moved to make sure that students are involved at every stage of the process. They're there as student reviewers now in every review team in England, as they have been in Scotland since 2004. They submit a written submission to the review team in advance of the review. Uh, at the conclusion of the review, they're involved now with institutions in drawing up the action plan, which will respond to any recommendations made uh, through external audit. Review teams can meet a range of students, a wider range of students, during the time that they visit. And importantly, uh, not all of those students will have been picked in advance by the institution concerned. At a constitutional level, we have student representatives on our board and we have an advisory board on which I and, uh, and the chairman of the, UK, uh, of the QAA board uh, take part. Um, sometimes the debate about student involvement, engagement, even ownership, as we have in front of us today, of higher education, um, gets caught up in the idea of student as consumer. And almost everyone seems to be against the idea of student as consumer. So uh, in the spirit of the debate, may I just put in a word for um, the usefulness sometimes of seeing students as consumers. Because students aren't only consumers, it doesn't mean that the consumer aspect of the student's relationship with higher education is unimportant. Indeed, the entire logic of students um, albeit in a, in, in a delayed and, and rather elaborate way, making a, a financial contribution to their higher education, must at one level imply a consumer relationship. Of course it doesn't describe the totality of the relationships, but it is important, and I think it's a mistake, to retreat from the implications of understanding how that is going to change student expectations over the next few years in relation to higher education. There are elements of consumerism, um, but it goes beyond that, and it's much more complex than that. But I think we can acknowledge both. Finally, in the introductory uh, paragraph about this debate in the program, there is a question which uh, asks us to consider whether a long and proud intellectual tradition is under threat from market forces. Um, I, would, uh, I would counsel that it's unwise to see what is currently happening to higher education as some kind of dramatic uh, break with the past. Um, the higher education sector, particularly in England, has been highly competitive for a very long time in all sorts of ways. And I sometimes think it's a mistake of those who wish to criticize higher education that they fail to recognize the degree to which competition has already been present for a long time in higher education and the benefits that it's brought in terms of institutional performance, diversity, etc. Um, so competition has been with us for a long time, market forces have been with us for a long time, and it's this desire to improve and to compete and to recruit that gives much of the dynamism to uh, English higher education, and indeed uh, in, to many aspects of higher education across the UK, although I'm aware that the patterns of participation vary from uh, country to country. Um, so I think we should welcome the entry of new providers uh, into higher education as being a development of that strongly established tradition already, rather than something that threatens it. But, but, and there would be a but, you probably guessed, there does need to be, of course, a common framework uh, for the assurance of quality across that expanded sector. There does need to be um, a concept, I think, as long as we value a UK higher education sector, there needs to be a commitment to uh, a universal approach to the assurance of quality uh, in that sector. Um, and therefore, uh, there also needs to be uh, an acceptance that in that assurance of quality, which is there principally for the benefit of students, regardless of the kinds of institutions that they progress to, um, that is where we should be locating the discussion about the appropriate engagement of students in the higher education system. There is, I think, though, further uh, to discuss, uh, uh, quite a lot further to discuss uh, in relation to private provision when private provision is for profit. 
Um, I mentioned right at the beginning of my introductory comments the importance of the charitable tradition, the public interest tradition in higher education. I'm not concluding that that means that the for-profit principle has no place in higher education, but in shifting from um, a, a conceptual framework where the benefit is seen as primarily public to one where there is, at least at one level, principally benefit for uh, individuals, uh, I think we there, see, we there do see a significant shift in the way that we're approaching higher education. And we only have to look across the Atlantic to see that there are debates there that need to be had uh, as we progress in, in that particular direction. Anthony. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anthony. So we have students involved as a key stakeholder and the engaged student, which seems a good opportunity to turn to Rachel and ask her to speak for five minutes, please. Hello. Um, I think today I'm going to talk about how I believe that uh, universities belong to communities. Uh, and first off, uh, universities belong to a community of learners. So just as a sort of quick audience participation, uh, please put your hands up if you believe that students are partners in knowledge creation. Wonderful. Good answer. Um, <laughs> well done. Um, and now put your hand up, please, if you believe that students are treated as partners in knowledge creation in their universities. Yeah, I would agree. <laughs> um, I think that sort of one of the sort of key issues that's, that's come out so far has been the issue of marketised higher education and uh, education is consumed and is sold as a product. Um, and I, I, I find that very uncomfortable. And I think one of the best ways that we can um, rid ourselves of that narrative is by creating a new narrative or by enhancing the narrative that already exists, that students are partners in knowledge creation, um, that we are co-producers of knowledge. Um, and I think that uh, you know, one of the best ways of doing that is by rewarding uh, behaviours that we find valuable that fit into that and that's about participation and about relationships between learners and when I talk about learners I'm, and a community of learners I do mean students and staff because I mean I was at a panel the other week and someone described lecturers as or was a lecturer actually who described themselves as uh, a student who'd just been doing it for a bit longer um, and I think that's a, I do actually think that's I believe that that's a really good way of describing it um, and I don't really like the idea of students just as uh, critical stakeholders. I think we're far more than that. I think that students, as part of this community of learners, determine and deserve to determine the quality of the student experience and the quality of their education. And I, I understand that the QAA provides uh, fantastic um, uh, structures for, to do this and there are tools that student unions and students can, to, can use to hold their institutions to account with this but in reality there are tools that are in, that's in the back seat uh, and students are holding the map while their university is driving the car because it, you know, it really should be students determining what quality looks like. Um, the way that we learn and the way that we're taught is something that is deeply political and shouldn't be standardised and measured sort of uh, quantitatively, something that's deeply you know, qualitative um, and, and a really great way of sort of looking at this is through student charters or partnership agreements that have come around in universities. This is something that obviously with £9,000 fees the government has had the impetus to sort of really hurry it up but I think they've always been there and actually if you look in Scotland, uh, the Scottish government is actually rolling this out across the board so I don't think this is an issue of nine grand fees, I think this is an issue of how we really view education and the joy of partnership agreements is that they don't set rights or responsibilities but they set mutual expectations between students and staff between students and students and between staff and staff um, and I think that going forward if, if universities are really to uh, broaden themselves to improve themselves and to allow students to really sit in the driving seat to determine quality without becoming uh, sort of consumer led if they're really going to allow uh, students to, to drive quality in their institutions it's going to be done through partnership agreements and I think you know, if we look at partnership agreements, they really sort of describe the soul of what education is. It's that relationship. Um, another way that student unions are doing this at the moment is through student-led teaching awards. Again, this is about the quality of the relationships between students and staff. It's not about how many hours of contact and how many out contact hours I have, but much more around what is the quality of that contact hours. And we've just looked at um, a survey that came out from the NUS uh, this week that was in the Times High that said 25.8% of students survey 
surveyed uh, want more interactive teaching time. So this isn't about being lectured, it's about being taught and being a participant in that education. Um, and again, I think in terms of treating students as partners and as part of that knowledge community, um, we have to start looking at sort of democratising our higher education institutions. So where are the real decisions now made? Um, because I think they are majoritively made by senior management, uh, away from the scrutiny of students and staff. And if we really want to put universities back into the hands of our le community of learners, then we have to look at where these decisions are being made. And also, who is making these decisions? Uh, so again, if you look at uh, councils, you know, university councils or senates, or, or not senates, sorry, or courts, um, which of the lay members have, are, are an active stakeholder in, in that learning? Often you have a couple of students who sit on there, but you know, are, there, are their views really taken seriously? Um, and is it about time that we had new students or potential students sitting on those boards? Is that a, is that a way that will ensure that university is owned by, by the community? Um, and moving on just quickly, I think that uh, public education is owned by the community and the communities that sit, the society and the communities that sit around our higher education institutions. And so if you look at widening access, for example, I don't just think that belongs to schools, but that, that belongs to our entire community. Obviously, you know, million plus has over 50% of them, uh, of their universities to take, sorry, 50% of students in million plus institutions are mature students. So in terms of widening access belonging to communities, that's a, that's a really important figure. Um, and there's some great work coming out of for example, Goldsmith Student Union at the moment, looking at working with prisons to widening access to university to those people who have come out of prisons. Um, and I think this sort of makes us look beyond just students and learners, but also the real value, the public value of higher education institutions. Um, and this is a sort of, I've finished with this example, which is usually the example I, I give. Uh, I have two friends, one Emma, this is a true story. Uh, I have more than two friends, but I, <laughs> <laughs> I, have, uh, I have two friends, Emma and Alan. Both Emma and Alan studied, at, uh, studied graphic design. Uh, Emma studied at Leeds University and Alan studied at Leeds Metropolitan University. And they both did fantastically well, they both worked very hard, they both have fantastic jobs now, um, but one of their degrees is considered more elite than the other. Um, and that really, that really disturbs me because they both have fantastic degrees and they both went to these universities for very different reasons. One, because it was research intensive and they liked that essay, that research side of their degree. And one, because it was uh, teaching intensive and Alan enjoyed the vocational side of his degree. And I think we have to stop talking about uh, elitism. If universities are to belong to society, we have to get rid of the idea of elitism straight away and we have to start looking at how universities can belong to all of society and all of our communities and how the uh, values and skills that are taught through university, no matter how, in inverted commas, elite your institution is, how we can use those um, and how uh, students can use those skills that they've learned to, to add to society and make the world a better place. Thank you, Rachel. Um, can I turn to uh, Heather now to speak um, uh, for five minutes or so? Heather um, from Hefke, the Funding Council uh, for England, and also the, uh, now the lead regulator as far as the um, Charities Commission is concerned. Thank you. Uh, you're going to hear some familiar themes, I fear, from me, but hopefully perhaps slightly different spin or perspective on some of them at any rate. Uh, I really wanted to start off, if you like, by um, looking at this statement from a number of in perspectives, trying to interrogate it and trying to interpret what it might actually mean to say that universities belong to students. And I thought of a number of ways of thinking about this statement, and I'm just going to briefly um, look at some of them. Uh, and the first one, I thought, was the obvious one, if you like. We could talk about universities belonging to students from the perspective of investment, particularly looking ahead as student loans come more and more to be the source of finance for teaching and indeed for paying your salaries uh, and so on. So one could say that in that sense, students belong, sorry, universities belong to students. But I think that might be 
an oversimplification in many ways because, of course, it forgets about all the other sources of income that universities have, including research, and it forgets about the many young, long years of public investment in the infrastructure of universities. And, of course, it also forgets that students are using public funds as loans. Many of them will pay back those loans. Many will not uh, once they start earning. So that's one way, perhaps, of looking at the question, thinking quite literally about the pound, shillings, and pence. I think another way of looking at it might be to say, who has the power within universities? Who governs? Who manages? Who makes the decisions? Rachel touched on this. I think she's quite right that over the last 20 years, there's been considerable change about the role of students in some of those structures. But I also think she's quite right in concluding that the actual uh, power and impact that of that is pretty small in the way decisions get made. So what about another aspect? This could be the teaching research argument. If you see students as linked to the learning and teaching aspect, but less so perhaps to the research aspect, even uh, postgraduate research students. I actually think this is a somewhat fruitless debate. Uh, in the UK, we have combined institutions which have both teaching and research functions, and there are links between them, perhaps not least that without students, we wouldn't have the future researchers. Uh, so I think that's about as far as I want to go with that one. I thought another way of looking at the question was a cultural one. What's the dominant culture of universities? And I think you can come up with very different answers. Perhaps if you're a member of the public or indeed a student, and you think about universities, you would think of students and student cultures, because of course they're plural, as, as being dominant. But of course for many people and for many staff in universities, the dominant culture is the research culture. So again, a very two-sided answer, I think, to, to, to that and, and no conclusive outcome. Just briefly, public universities are students a proxy for the public, the public good of universities? I don't think they are, because I think the public good, as it were, is a much wider perspective than that of students. We've seen from other speakers uh, about student engagement and other ways in which the student role is changing, so I don't want to touch any further on that. So I'll maybe just conclude by saying, do I think student, uh, universities belong to students? No. Do I think they should belong more to students? Yes. I think most definitely. But I think it should be a relationship that is about partnership and not one that is about consumerism. Despite what Anthony has said, and I think there's some truth in it, that of course at points students are consumers, you cannot have a learning community in which you have consumers. That's not how it works, uh, and that's not what learning is about. So I think, again, a multifaceted role, but a yes and no answer to, to the actual statement. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Um, is anybody gesticulating wildly at me at the moment that I can't see? In that case, I will just ask some questions of the panel. Pam's rather nicely framed it at the end in this concept of partnership versus consumerism. Certainly here at the University of Manchester, um, students as consumers is not very liked by the academic community, but it's also not very liked by the student community either. It's rather liked by myself on occasions, but I seem to um, be in opposition to um, those uh, interests. So, uh, Anthony, you raised the issue of there being some aspects of what is offered to students in a university having a more consumer orientation to them. Do you want to say a little bit more about that? Uh, yeah, I'll say something about that. Um, uh, and the, re the reason I introduced that was because, as I said, there's a sort of consensus 
of people coming from many different directions that to describe students as consumers is wrong, uh, inadequate, uh, uh, doesn't fit the true nature of the relationship, etc. And I think what I was trying to say was that um, it's just occasionally I question the motives of those who don't wish to talk at all about the consumer aspect of the relationship. I would entirely agree that the complete engagement of the student with higher education can't be described as a consumer relationship for, for the reasons that Heather gave and for other reasons. But there are aspects of it which have the features of a consumer relationship, particularly, obviously, at the point of admission, where a contract is formed between a provider and someone who is choosing, I increasingly, you know, it's hard to avoid the term, purchasing those services. There are aspects of the university experience which will be directly consumer experiences. You will want to know that the bathroom you're paying for in your student accommodation is at a certain level, that you can get the right standard of uh, support from the various support agencies within the university. And if there are other things that have uh, attracted you to go to that place, you'll want to know that they're going to be delivered. So what I'm sometimes wary of is perhaps particularly from within institutions, a wish not to talk about or to deflect the consumer conversation as a way of what I see sometimes as a wider tendency to wish to mystify higher education. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, can we tell students about contact hours? Well, of course, contact hours don't describe the whole learning experience. Of course they don't. But that doesn't mean you can't tell students what the contact hours are. So it's about, you know, taking some of the, mis uh, the mystification, I think, out of the relationship with higher education, rightly allocating um, very high purposes to the full higher education experience, but equally being realistic and level-headed and honest and contractual about those aspects which do fit within a consumer relationship. Thanks, Anthony. Rachel, are NUS totally uncomfortable with the word consumer, or do they see some... Um, strength in some of the aspects of what Anthony's saying. Um, I think when uh, the new f the fee new fee rate new fees regime passed, there was sort of that conversation about how far do we take the issue of consumerism? Uh, can we get out from our universities what we've always wanted? Because now of this sense of competition, they'll be willing to throw money at students and and you know the students' union and, and do everything they can to attract students. But I think quite quickly we realised just uh, the just how big the pitfalls of consumerism really are. And I, my, my biggest worry, actually, if you look at issues like, say, for, for example, retention. So the government, because, you know, they, the government's saying, well, you go and buy your degree. Well, you can choose where you want to go. You can, you know, if you decide that your degree is no good for you anymore, you can just get up and leave. And any student that's ever tried to change course, let alone their institution, knows that that's now and impossible. Um, so, you know, the, the whole idea of consumerism, I, I think, is quite dangerous. Um, and it actually d means that universities don't have to deal with issues like retention, where students are not supported, where personal tutors are not doing their jobs in, uh, in creating that relationship, in having that proactive relationship that brings students in. Um, and, and, and I think that's why it's very dangerous. I think it's also, if you, if you talk about consumerism, we talk about students' rights. But I think, you know, and, and what we saw actually was... Uh, a load of uh, universities, when, we write, when students started writing their student charters, go out and get them checked by uh, lawyers and check that you know, they couldn't be held, held uh, sued for, for whatever they promised. And I think it's far more powerful to have mutual expectations set out in partnership agreements that are then voted on by a cross-campus ballot of students and are understood locally by course reps, by staff, by administrative staff, as well as lecturers. I think that's far more powerful and will change the way universities teach far more than, uh, than com uh, competition and a market. Thank you. Pam, you commented on biz having this view as students, as customers, and then went on to talk uh, about whether um, it was a perfect context for students um, to own universities or whether it would be broader than that. Do you want to add anything to what Rachel Anthony said? Well, I think this debate about consumerism is actually a cul-de-sac debate. I mean, if we turn the clock back to 1997, uh, when there were no fees paid, would there still, we'd still have some relationships between students and their universities 
and which were clearly contractual, you know, whether it's accommodation or so on and so forth. But if you want to talk about consumers, it's got to be the other side of the coin. And consumers should be able to operate in a free market. And we don't have a free market. So, the, so bids can't have it both ways. And the reason why we don't have a free market is because we've got price constraint, even within the 9,000K cap, and we've got number constraint, and we've got it being operated in a way this disadvantages particular, uh, well, large numbers of universities. So we talk about what the university should do because students are paying allegedly more. They're not paying more in the sense that they are borrowing more um, and will pay back to some extent, but nothing like the extent to which the government says in public, as you knew from Barham this morning, they will contribute back in the long run. Um, but I think that what we should talk, be talking about, really, is not consumerism, but actually what is the overall uh, pattern for the future. And I think the bigger risk is the fact that we don't distinguish between what are fundamentally private providers and universities that operate much more in the public interest. And I think that's the bigger debate. So if we move on perhaps to that um, uh, bigger debate. We have no higher education bill coming forward. We have private providers provided they are charging less than £6,000 free to, to recruit. No student number control associated with those. That's not a very nice place for the regulator uh, to be. Um, Heather, do you want to comment on that at all? I'm happy to comment on that. I think we need to distinguish between uh, what the white paper aspires to and what circumstances we currently have and what might be in the future. And they're all in very different places. And I think that is why you have potentially uh, some mismatches within what is happening so that there are, uh, for example, uh, part-time student numbers are not controlled in any way, but full-time student numbers are. And we all know the reason why, or full-time numbers at public universities, if we can use that non-British expression. We all know the reason why. It's because of a need to control government finances. Uh, and BIS has one envelope of funding. Uh, it's divided between uh, student loans and hefty teaching funding, if we're thinking of teaching. And if that amount of money is exceeded, one or the other has to give. It will either be hefty teaching funding or it will be student loans. And that is why the number of students in universities that, that uh, receive public funding in the conventional sense of the word. That's why student funding is controlled and the mechanism through which it is controlled is student number control. So the student number control isn't uh, really, uh, if you like, primarily aimed at uh, influencing or reducing or controlling the number of students. It's a pure financial measure. I got a bit away from uh, regulation there, I'm afraid, but um, Hefke uh, doesn't have any different powers from those it had before the white paper. We don't know what the position will or won't be after any possible legislation. Thank you. Um, we're having a rather English debate at the moment. Are some I'm colleagues sorry. from devolved administrations in the audience? Could they put their hands up, please, if there are? I've got one and two over here. Did anybody want to say anything about whether this debate is also going on in Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland in the same way? Uh, I'm from uh, the Scottish system. I'm at the University of Aberdeen. And obviously we're having similar debates. Um, clearly the introduction of fees for the rest of the UK students will destabilise our system. We are currently tracking KISS um, because we will implement KISS because you can't compete for the same market and off not offer the same set of information sets. Um, so I think, yes, the debate, the divide that devolution appears to have created um, is, is actually not quite as huge as we think. There are different approaches um, and what happens with those different approaches from the funding councils is that we wind up with 
different solutions to the same problems. But the problems are universal, I think, that we're facing. It's about a global change, about different circumstances, about how we fund higher education, which is a debate that's been going on for a number of years, and I don't think we've got it right yet. Um, but I think, yes, it's entire, this, the debate that you're having may be slightly different from my perspective from Scotland, but the questions are entirely as valid. Okay, there was another question just back into my left over there. I was with your Vice-Chancellor yesterday, uh, by the way, so uh, I shared a, a platform with him yesterday, yes. Um, I'm also from a Scottish institution, and I think that while the debate about funding and students as consumers and whether students own universities is apt for Scotland, I think we are facing other issues such as the length of our degree programmes, potential duplication within our system. We have a four-year, traditionally a four-year degree structure and the Scottish Government is incredibly concerned that the final year of a school education is the same as the first year of a university education. Um, I wonder if the panel would, could comment on that particular aspect. So any comments from the panel on devolved administration? Um, I was actually going to make a comment about the last point that you made about sort of flexible provision, basically. And again, I think it sort of goes back to the whole elitism argument that when you talk to Russell Group universities and you talk about two-year degrees and, and they scoff and say, no, 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 we can't do that. that. You know, that's the way that we teach them. But actually, my, the, my biggest concern with private provision is that it will be the lower quality uh, sort of flexible provision that they'll be offering um, that's incredibly damaging because it, because of the issue of affordability. There's no, there won't be a real choice. There's no free market in terms of where people are going. People who cannot afford to go for £9,000 Russell Group degrees will then end up going to these private providers where they don't have the same assurances, they don't have the same representation, and I think that's very dangerous. Can I just add something? Uh, because... Um, following on really uh, from, from those points, uh, uh, an absolutely free market, of course, uh, wouldn't care about the reputation of the whole market. You know, in, in fact, a, a truly completely free market would operate more effectively with failure. If there was some failure, then that is a stimulus to the improvement of the market. Um, that, I think, for all sorts of reasons, is, is, is a dangerous path to go down and that we would lose at our peril really the sense of a sector within which there are a spectrum of institutions and diversity of institutions but within a framework where certain common assumptions can be made about the standard and the quality of what's going to be offered and I think uh, I think this is relevant also to the question about the impact of the devolved uh, the fact that education, higher education is devolved within the UK. I mentioned in, in my introductory comments the significance of the reputation of the UK system. And I think by and large, the further you get from the boundaries of the UK, the less people internationally distinguish between the various parts of the UK. And they have a strong sense of the reputation of a particular higher education system, which despite its differences still has more in common with, with the various parts and it does differences. Now, whether that will continue to be the case, uh, I don't know, you know, we're clearly at a very interesting time, not only in the politics of higher education, but in the politics of the relationship between the constituent parts of the UK. And that latter set of politics may have impacts on higher education that are actually nothing to do with higher education, but nevertheless are played out through higher education as they will no doubt be played out elsewhere and to some extent for those of us in this room it'll be, we, those will be things that we will have to respond to rather than than shape but to the extent that we can shape higher education i think and i think a colleague from aberdeen made this point i think it would be wrong to see what's happening at the moment simply as a process of divergence i think it's much more complex than that and even in our own uh, when i say our uh, qaa sphere of quality assurance we can see in the quality assurance regimes in the four parts of the UK, we can certainly see some elements of divergence, and they may become more divergent, particularly as England follows a more risk-based approach to 
quality assurance, but equally we can see convergence. And you've mentioned the Scottish adoption of the KISS. Um, the Welsh system from next year will move to adopt uh, the new system of, of judgments that are in the English review system. So it's not at all a movement in one direction. It's, there are lots and lots of cross currents. Pam, you wanted to comment on this. Uh, well, just briefly, I mean, in England, we've got more central control in spite of what the coalition says. I think than ever, ever before in terms of the prices that you can charge within the range uh, and the numbers that you can recruit because there are penalties if you don't uh, come in under a certain price. I think the interesting thing about Scotland are the proposals, the governance proposals, which actually take, take us one step further in a different direction in terms of the control of the Scottish government on the governance arrangements of Scottish institutions. And I see that as a whole different ball game, one where we're not at, we're not in the same place. Uh, but I just want to have one last crack at the consumer debate, be very naughty, and say, look, I just disagree with the idea that we sell British higher, higher education internationally on, on the basis that you buy your higher education in Britain and it's better than here, here than in Australia. That's not how we trade internationally. Our reputation is not as a nation and nations that trade basically on consumerism. We trade on quality, reputation, excellence of teaching and research. And the, when we start moving ourselves away from that language, then we're beginning to do the government's job for it. Heather, did you want to add anything to this, recognising that you must be talking to your colleagues in the devolved administration about the joy of students moving around the UK and uh, exercising choice between different fee regimes? Um, I don't think I have a great deal to add. I th do think, however, that there is the potential for more impact than we're aware of from flows of students between different administrations and the financial consequences that that may actually have as to whether each country is a net importer or exporter of students uh, and the way that that might affect finances. We'll have to wait and see, however, uh, as to what actually happens. Thank you. I want to give the opportunity to open the questions up to the, the auditorium. I'm in your hands. I've been told you're lively and engaging and are sure to ask lots of questions of the panel, so here's your choice. I see a lady in purple um, just here in this aisle. Hi, I'm Siobhan Cartwright. I'm teaching learning manager here at the uh, medical school at Manchester. I'm interested, um, Rachel, I ran a workshop yesterday around managing expectations because uh, from experience the workshop came out of working with students in the medical school and two questions about they didn't realize they had to buy books when they came to higher, you know, to university. I had a similar conversation with the Students' Union Academic Affairs Officer. So I realized I had quite a lot of work to do with the students in helping them understand what higher education is. And um, I think there's a lot more work to be done on that. And I was just interested, I do agree with you that we have to have students engage more and more with the quality provision, but I think until they understand what higher education is, then how can they really be clear about what the quality of the provision is? That's my, that's my take. I wonder what yours is. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, on sort of two issues. Firstly, on the sort of hidden course cost issue. Um, obviously, NUS took a load of action on this, I think it was last week, uh, with walkouts, and there was action all over the country, and student unions doing loads of different things, and have actually just, uh, sort of, I think there was a piece in the Times High yesterday at how successful that action had been. And that is asking vice chancellors and universities to come clean, basically, on, uh, you know, what hidden course costs there are in, in uh, different courses and to publish those costs before students arrive at university and also to swallow some of those costs because you know finances shouldn't be a barrier to you uh, thriving at university. It's not just simply a case of surviving and if you're from a less privileged background you don't go on that uh, field trip that you need to do or you cannot buy that book and therefore you have to wait a week to get it from the library. You know, if it's going to be an equality of um, an, equ an equality of of provision, uh, then those sort of costs have to be swallowed or at least advertised. Um, in terms of expectations, I, I actually completely agree. Um, there's a fantastic uh, 
campaign run by Brunel Students Union called Taught Not Lectured. Um, and that's basically trying to teach students that when they get to university, it's not a case of sitting like you do in a classroom and being talked at for uh, half an hour and then going away and doing your homework. It's, it's about participation. And I think student unions have a responsibility to do that. But I think primarily universities have a responsibility to teach students and set those expectations as soon as they arrive. And rather than cramming uh, four, you know, four weeks worth of induction in the first week, they should wait to teach students about the library or wait to show them around the, the city even and talk about what they can expect from their university experience um, and that I, I, it's something that I think postgraduates that now being a postgraduate something I realize about that relationship that I have between my between students and staff but again it's it's talking about those relationships and it's talking about student unions being at the very heart of setting that quality um, and and again talking about how students can be part of that so for example through course reps and school reps who are you know one of the best ways of doing this and are absolutely fundamental to uh, creating a good student experience on campus Heather, you wanted a comment as well. I wanted to say pretty much what Rachel has just said. I think that uh, you, you brought up the question of students needing to understand what HE is. They certainly do, but it's absolutely the responsibility of universities to help bring that understanding about. And it just can't be underestimated. And if it's not done, it's no wonder that students will end up only as consumers and not as informed participants who are ready to learn in an HE manner. And it's an absolutely vital task that institutions have to do and that I fear many academics in universities don't appreciate and perhaps don't yet have the skills in very large part to undertake. And I think it's absolutely vital. And it's almost, if you like, the counterpart to what Anthony was saying about contact hours. Yes, of course, students should have some idea of what their contact hours will be, but also, as Rachel has said, contact hours are not really what it's about. You can have as many contact hours as you like without necessarily learning. And so students need to be helped to understand how to make use of the benefit of the range of experiences that ought to be available to them. And what you actually do with those contact hours is far more important than how many they are. OK, another question. I see a hand in the middle, and there's one up at the back left as well. I'll go back left first, because the mic's there, and then I'll come down to the middle. Thanks. Uh, Reagan Hiles, uh, Moshi, the National Student Services Organization. Returning to the question of who do universities belong to, it occurred to me when you threw it out there for people from devolved administrations to, to speak their mind, so to speak. I have a national policy brief, which isn't daunting in the slightest, um, and I'm regularly reading things coming out of the other administrations, really firmly steering institutions towards things like merger or what they should represent and, and what each institution should be. So thinking about the who do universities belong to, and before I put this out there and you will lynch me, I should point out I do not advocate the end of this sentence, nor do I necessarily think it's right. But if we can steer, or government can steer, so much the identity of universities, does that mean that universities belong to government? Sorry, could you just repeat that last piece again? We were struggling, I think, to hear um, Does that mean that universities belong to government when actually there can be real policy drivers that force universities to behave or act in certain ways. So do policies belong to government? Okay, Pam, do you want to comment on So universities belong to government. Thank you. Pam. Uh, well, no. They do their best to kind of innovate in spite of government, in my experience. Um, uh, so, but of course, government has the funding drivers, um, both actually to a large extent, around research and as well as teaching. But if you look at all of these different sources of income, you'll also find that there are sources of income, as you know, from the Department for Education, from the NHS, but also 
uh, income that universities earn, if I can put it this way, entirely outside of any government funding drivers. And I think the most innovative universities have got a number of different income streams and will use those to the benefit of, of students. Um, but it is a tricky relationship and those people who say they want to step out of the ring and no longer be funded in terms of teaching funding or regulated because they don't get very much, I just invite them to step away from all of the government um, sponsored research funding that they also receive and see if they change their tune then. I don't think you can have your cake and eat it and if you want to be funded for uh, research then you really can't step out of the quality or the regulation ring. So if I may follow up on that, teaching um, fund allocation to many universities substantially reduced, I was talking to one earlier in the week, 90 some percent of their teaching income gone, um, million plus I understand down from about 36 million to about 32 million in terms of QR income. If that trend continues, would you still have that view in, in a few years' uh, time, Pam? Uh, uh, oh, well, I think it's very much up to universities, but I don't think anybody will move away from actually having that research income. I mean, the research income pot is very large. Um, and, you know, there's an article by Peter Scott in today's Guardian where he debates, you know, people who are saying that they may not want to be part of the um, arrangements any longer. Uh, well, my line is let them get on with it, but don't let them take student loans, right, which are funded by the whole taxpayer and not just by graduates, and, you know, get on with it as well in terms of your research funding. So I think at the end of the day, you'll actually find that even universities have tried to grow their research and are very effective and excellent uh, at research, will still continue to invest in research even though research income declines. There's a very good reason for that, uh, which is that you can't trade internationally and it's not fair for students if you don't have research informed teaching. I've promised a question in the middle, but Alison, did you want to just follow up on this topic? Okay, the um, lady in the middle in grey, I think, had her hand up earlier. There's a mic to your left if you want to use it. Hi, um, I'm Alan Pezienza. I work at Manchester Metropolitan University, um, but I am an American, so I've certainly been learning a lot about HE um, in the UK over the past few years. But one of the things I wanted to comment about, which is similar to a colleague um, to my left, is around where students fit in in terms of the quality assurance and how can they be part of that equation when yeah, I think many times in reality, they're barely engaging with what they're trying to dictate the outcomes of. Um, I'm, I'm the annoying administrator in the family and my husband is the annoying academic in the family. And, you know, from his experience, you know, teaching at Leeds Metropolitan for the past six years, is that when we run seminar, two students attend. So. But then at the end of the year, when it's time for quality assurance and NSS input, et cetera, suddenly the department's supposed to bend over backwards to whatever the latest thing is that students would like. And I guess maybe, Rachel, you know, from National University Students, it's, I guess it's hard sometimes for myself, you know, as an administrator to help reconcile some of the initiatives and et cetera that we're doing um, when it seems to be based on a very small percentage of active students like yourself. Um, so I guess where do we draw the line as administrators and academics in terms of what, this, not, what we expect from students coming in and, and what they can expect from us? It just seems that the goalposts are being pushed. And now it seems, just from the off comment from the panel, is now we need to teach them how to learn. Is this, am I getting the wrong end of the stick? It just... I go to Rachel and, and Anthony now and ask for a brief response to can students really engage given their position and um, the other pressures that are uh, upon them. Rachel, do you want to cover that first? Um, I, I think students engage where they feel that those expectations are relevant to them. 
So, for example, if you look at student-led teaching awards that have sort of been rolled out across the UK over the, over the course of the last couple of years, um, the number of nominations that student unions receive for student-led teaching awards are in their thousands. And I think it's because it's a measure of something that students can feel and, and, and have that emotional sort of attachment to. So celebrate, celebrating their innovative teacher or their teacher that inspires them to go on to do great things. I mean, I, I haven't had a... I personally have not had a great involvement in sort of the QAA student engagement, but for me, my, my worry with that is that it's soulless, and so I wouldn't necessarily want to get, get involved. But the idea of student-led teaching awards is that they, that's the very heart of, of, uh, and the very soul of a university, that teaching and that relationship between students and staff. Um, just sort of to, on your point of teaching students how to learn, I think one of the big issues that I, I didn't cover before was that actually... If you're a student who hasn't been to university before or hasn't had family who've been to university, you don't have that social capital, you don't have that understanding of, of what it means to learn. And if we're serious about creating universities that are open and accessible for all students, no matter what age, because again, if you've been out of the learning, formal learning environment for 20 years or 15 years, what does learning look like and how has it changed? Then yeah, I do think we have to be absolutely serious about teaching students how to learn um, and, and creating those expectations and also understanding those locally because a university like Leeds, you know, it's 32,000 students, the departments looked very different. Um, so what does that look like in each of those departments as well? Yeah, I would just add, um, from the point of view of QAA, we, we certainly wouldn't confuse the idea of students being engaged with the quality of their higher education simply with their formal engagement with the structures of QAA. Having, having said that, when we went to recruit student uh, reviewers, we, we had a, an overwhelming response, very, very strong response. But of course, you're still talking about a fraction of the total student population. Uh, the effective engagement with quality assurance in our terms, therefore, this is why I mentioned how we saw the concept of the engaged student, does not depend simply on the number of students becoming quality reviewers. It depends upon an engagement of the kind that Rachel's described, which then should uh, naturally lead to a wish to feed back, to give input, to, and, and, and to so start that cycle of, of improvement with, with which students can be involved. The problem of engagement in free societies goes way beyond higher education. You know, the very low levels of turnout in, in elections is, is, is actually a huge problem for our democracy. Um, so uh, the, the problem of engagement of children at schools when education is compulsory is enormous. So there are problems, uh, very widespread problems, about how one engages without coercion, so to speak. And, you know, some of the initiatives that Rachel's pointed to are clearly part of doing that. But, but, but much more needs to be done. But we, we shouldn't confuse it simply with formal participation. I think that point's already been made earlier on. Formal participation is, is crucial and it's an important development, but it's necessarily limited. And the people who wish to become very formally involved in some of these structures will always, I suspect, be a relatively small percentage of the total number of, of students. I'm afraid we're running out of time, Alison, so I'm not sure I can come to you for uh, another question. I'm going to hand over to Alison in a moment, but you've lived up to your billing of being lively, engaging, questioning. But can you join me in thanking the panel for their time and efforts today? <laughs> <laughs>